Really thrilled to have Elliot Montgomery with us today. There's a few things I would say about Elliot. I'll be super brief. Uh, Elliot was one of the founding faculty of this program and taught a futuring class here for two years. Uh, we are forever grateful for that contribution um, and helping set the students and the pedagogy um, in a really, really wonderful way. Uh, and the second thing I would say is, you know, things are just so sad out there. Um, and if I was going to like imagine like a design life, I'd want to have Elliot Montgomery's design life. Like everything that he does is just so joyful, even when it's very, very serious. There is a lightness to his work that is absolutely extraordinary and just makes me so optimistic. It actually makes me want to be a designer. It makes me want to be in the world of design. And then the third thing that I'll say, which is the thing that I always say, is that Elliot will likely talk about his firm? What would you call it? Organization? Practice. His practice called the Extrapolation Factory, which has to be the best name for a design concern in history and will always be. The Extrapolation Factory will not be beat as a design office name. You can try. Um, even that name makes me so happy and so optimistic. And so I hope you'll feel the same way uh, when you meet Elliot and see his work. We're very, very proud to have you here. So please Thank welcome you. Elliot Montgomery. Thank you. Yeah, like Alan said, it's, um, it's been a while since I taught here as part of the faculty, but it's truly a pleasure to be back. It always feels like home when I'm here. Uh, it feels like I'm with family, even when I'm meeting new faces. Hello to all the new faces and to all of you. Um, <clears throat> so let's see, I guess we'll use the old school. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, what I like to call social rule bending, or um, in this case, some experiments in social rule bending. I do run a practice called the Extrapolation Factory. We're based in Brooklyn. I'll show some of the work that we do in the practice. Um, we'll get into that. And then I'm going to show some work by uh, designers that I admire, designers who I think are interesting, and some of my past students. Uh, that I, I think kind of show us some interesting ways into alternative design spaces. Um, how many of you are, are familiar with uh, the term future studies or the field of future studies? Just put your hands up. Okay, so a decent number of you. Speculative design, maybe a few more of you. Okay, cool. Um, so I think these terms are, are starting to become uh, pretty common household names in the context of design schools and design practice. Um, and we, we like them because they, in the, the way that Alan was talking about it, they give us these opportunities for optimism, hope, uh, experimentation, a little bit of playfulness in a world that feels so heavy and dreary so much of the time. Um, they're also very delicate and uh, very problematic in a lot of cases. And, and so I think for us to, uh, to really look at what we mean by these terms, when we use these terms, is really important as we develop our own practices, which is what you guys are all doing while you're here at POD. So this uh, tongue-in-cheek diagram was uh, something that I put together in early days as I was trying to explain the, um, the interest in uniting futures thinking, future studies, with design. So um, when I talk to friends and family, oftentimes I find that um, these folks, myself included in many cases, are not amazing at using tools for thinking about long-term futures or planning for thinking about long-term fut futures beyond the very immediate personal versions of futures. So if you're a good personal futurist, you might make a, a shopping list to plan for the future of your dinner. You might check the weather app to plan for the future of your outfit. Uh, if you're a really good personal futurist, you might be using a calendar to plan for the future of your vacation, so on and so forth. You get the picture. Uh, but these are all kind of worlds that orbit around ourselves. They, they don't take into account very many external factors. They don't operate on the socio-technical level in any capacity. Um, usually the futures tools that we have um, at our disposal are very limited. And this is, this is an issue. This is kind of why I think futures studies and futures 
as it meets design has a really powerful role to play in the world uh, beyond the kind of the small think tanks where futures oftentimes are being used, these, these futures oriented exercises. Um, a while ago, I started to uh, tease out what we mean when we talk about futures in design. Um, speculative design is oftentimes the, the term that, that most people arrive at early on, um, oftentimes thanks to Dunn and Raby, um, who uh, coined the term critical design and then shortly after that coined the term speculative design. And so we, we hear speculative design and, and we think of this bubble that sits somewhere between art and design, right? Which feels very abstract, a little bit difficult to, to sink your teeth into. I was teaching speculative design in the early days of, of my work in academia, um, and students would say, well, it could just kind of be anything, right? Like, no matter what I do, it kind of fits in this funny, fuzzy bubble of design and art. And so we started to nuance the discussion um, as a collaboration. Started to say, all right, well, so where does strategy live? And how does future studies build into this? And do we start to see more specific areas of practice or approaches that a practitioner might be able to pick up and use and uh, to, to build a community around that gives us a better sense of exactly what we're talking about. And that leads into these subspaces where we see science fiction playing into this overlap space between speculative design and art. Something like design futures popping up in this space between strategy, design, speculative design, and then design thinking. Maybe this is a moment we can step back and say, is design thinking a, a very futures-oriented activity, or does design thinking oftentimes reflect on the now, this uh, hyper-ethnographic way of understanding the user, watching, observing, seeing how people work in the present, proposing an alternative version of the present, as opposed to foreshadowing, forecasting technologies that haven't even been invented as a way to introduce fictional problems that change the way we see the world around us. So this situates some of these practices. And this type of exercise, this is absolutely not finished. There are a lot of holes in this illustration, but it's useful. It gives us a grounding for where we're practicing, what types of projects we might be doing, who else is doing projects that uh, maybe talk to the work that we're doing. These types of, of conversations need to be happening more in speculative design uh, communities of practice, um, especially as these practices grow and become more critical of themselves. Um, and as design communities in, in uh, broad terms become critical of speculative design, I think speculative design needs to know what it is and, and what it's doing and, and who it's uh, coming up against as it explores the boundaries of these spaces. Many of you are probably familiar with this list. Uh, how many have read Speculative Everything by Dunn and Raby? OK, about half of you. I'm sure in uh, second year, you will all read it. So um, get ready. It's a lot of fun. But this is an excerpt, very short excerpt, from Speculative Everything. And uh, what Dunn and Raby were trying to propose here is that there might be these alternative formats of design. This is kind of where speculative design is coming from. So instead of uh, designing for production, we're designing for debate. Instead of designing for fun, we're designing for satire. Um, and the list can go on. They suggested that there might be a C column and a D column and an E column, on and on, where we start to see design taking on uh, roles and gaining agency to do things that it just hasn't been able to do in the past, or we haven't given it time to do these things in the past. So we can see where speculative design starts to take its form in this B column. I also like to introduce this framework that was proposed by uh, Bruce and Stephanie Tharp. Are you guys familiar with this? Uh, this was actually uh, published in Core 77 quite a while ago. Um, but I think it's still really potent at this moment. Uh, the Tharps actually recently published a book called Discursive Design. Discursive Design and Speculative Design have a lot of overlap. They, they sit in the same territory. Uh, but the Tharps talk about this, this notion that there are generally four different spaces that design projects or approaches sit. So you have the commercial design, the, the iPhone that we all love or hate, uh, but probably have sitting in our pockets. Um, these projects that move out into the humanitarian territory. Um, Nicholas Negroponte worked on the, the One Laptop Per Child project, where we saw these propositions that people throughout the world should have access to digital technology and digital communications. Um, some of these projects don't necessarily do good. It's, it's not easy to say that the OLPC project was 
was a, a purely beneficial project. There are a lot of social critiques of this project, but the intention is not to make money. The intention has shifted away, and now it's focused on uh, exploring how we can change the world for the better in the moment. Then we move into the experimental. This is a scenario where designers are oftentimes playing with materiality or the, the very strict notion of, of how design gets done, that process of design. So this is a, a project that the Tharps used as an example, and I really love this project. This is a project by a, a Swedish group, and they've been employed uh, various animals or critters to introduce different ways of designing. And so here you have a, a mouse that's chewing through a roll of paper as a way to design wallpaper for your home. Um, this is a, a data tracked uh, path of a fly. It's been flying around a lamp and it was turned into a vase. So this is the, the approach of, of an experimental designer or if you were to uh, take on experimental design in your own practice, you might work in these territories. And then the last space that the Tharps talk about is this space of discursive design that, that maps pretty closely to speculative design. Um, and in this case, they're suggesting that design really is for debate. Design, the outcome or the product of design in this case is the conversation that happens. People always ask me what types of conversations need to be happening that are so much more important than designing the, the object, right? The humanitarian hunk of plastic and, and digital guts. Um, and I think there are certain moments where discursive design really needs to live and other moments where it might not make sense. So the Gates uh, Foundation recently announced that they have been able to genetically modify a mosquito so that it's no longer a vector for malaria in many African countries. And this is a, a really interesting moment in time, right? We have a potential opportunity to transform illness and disease, a deadly uh, disease uh, for, for many, many people in the world, um, which sounds like a, a positive, certainly, uh, but at the same time, we're faced with the complex implications that we don't fully understand having to do with what happens when you release a genetically modified mosquito into the ecosystem. We don't know the answer to this question, and this is a perfect opportunity to bring discursive design into the picture. So I think this is where discursive design lives. This image that you see behind me is an early project by Dunn and Raby. They were looking at um, electromagnetic fields and how those might manipulate social experience, uh, lived experience in the, the home. And so this is a very simple furniture proposition. It's a table with a, a grid of, I think, 40 compasses or 50 compasses. And when your mobile phone gets a call, these compasses go haywire. So anytime there's a, a shift in the electromagnetic fields around you, this table tells you what's happening. And it's not necessarily meant to fix a problem. It's not meant to uh, solve something. It's, it's not probably very good at having dinner at, but it does change your relationship to the digital devices, telecommunication devices around you, right? You, you sit at the dinner table and all of a sudden the compasses are going haywire and you start to ask yourself, like, is that going into my brain? Is it going into my food? What is happening in this moment? So this is another really nice example of discursive design. So one other frame that I think is interesting as we start to talk about uh, a number of these issues, futures, future studies, um, is to think about how we, how we position some of the uh, ideas that are being put forth. So I'm guessing many of you have seen a diagram along these lines, the futures cone. So this is actually a diagram that was proposed by um, Joseph Voros, I think in 1993. Um, this is my rendition, but his looked quite similar to this one. Um, and so the idea is that in a, a Western notion of time, moving left to right, you have, um, you know, if you stand over here, you're looking into time. You're seeing these possibilities. You're seeing the most probable versions of futures. And then out here, the plausible. We can believe that'll happen, but we, we don't know that's going to happen. We don't have that gut feeling. And then the possible and then the impossible. I think this is useful, but I think there are a lot of problems with this diagram. First of all, it starts at a single point. And we all know that there are at least, what, 50 different present viewpoints in this room at this moment. And there are many more out there in the world. And so to say that everybody's starting in the same present is a fallacy. We know that all of our presents are very different. We understand truth in very different ways. Truth is a much more 
difficult and, and um, problematized term in this moment in, in the world than it ever has been before, but it's always been difficult, right? The way history is understood has a lot to do with who's writing the history. So this notion of a, a singular past and a, a in time that represents experience is very socially, it makes me feel uneasy. Second, there's this, this uh, illusion that we're going to shoot forward and then just stop here, right? There's this clean slice in some future point, and that's where we see the future. The future becomes a destination. And if we really think about what futures are, they're not destinations. They're, they're moments uh, along potentially an infinite journey, right? We might have our, our life to confine future scenarios, but time very well may continue on forever and ever. Um, and so this, this idea that there's just a, a clean slice, future is here, we stop and all take a breather, have a Gatorade or whatever, it just it doesn't work that way. Um, and then lastly, I think it's difficult for me to, to look at a diagram and not just imagine the impossible kind of going out ad finitum, right? It, just, it looks like it keeps going forever and ever and ever. It expands out. And when we think about what futures really are, they're not, um, there is no future, first of all, right? There are only multiple futures. And we, there is no one real futures. Futures are all fictions. And they're helpful fictions. They're really productive fictions. But there's no truth in futures. So for us to say that um, you know, futures are these kind of ever-expanding range of possibilities, we can probably say that to a certain degree if we're playing a game of chess. Like if I make one move, then there are three more moves that you can counter with, and then there are five moves that I can counter with. They kind of diverge out from there. But if we're talking about social futures, these narratives that we tell one another to build consensus, to develop plans, uh, to debate, those futures have a much more organic shape. And so I've been playing with these ideas for how we can revisualize what futures look like. And I, I've been really inspired by the way NOAA and other atmospheric projectors are looking at uh, showing how weather patterns might um, move forward in time, right? So this is a, an illustration of a hurricane that currently sits here just outside of Cuba and um, on top of the Bahamas. Um, this is certainly a um, you know, a, a problematic moment in the Bahamas, um, but there's potential problem uh, to be witnessed in uh, many other places as well. And so as a, an atmospheric projector, what we want to do is try to figure out how we can communicate most clearly using these visuals to reduce the harm, right? To help people get out of the way of this very devastating storm. And so what you see up here at the top is that um, the, the illustrator essentially has to say that this shape is not necessarily the storm. It's not that the storm is just going to grow and grow and grow and turn into this giant mass, but rather these are the many paths that the storm could take, right? The storm is like this, and it could come out here, or it could come out here, it could come out any of these different places. And so these are the different narratives that we need to be taking into consideration as we think about the possible futures of this storm. And so I'd like to bring that back to this visualization of the futures cone. So instead of having this singular point that we start at, if this is our, our present slice, we're all living in different versions of futures. There's this level of subjectivity in the present, and this is really important. Second, the history is really uh, diverse. It's spread out, because as, as we look back at history, I may remember one thing or know about one thing that some of you are not familiar with and vice versa. You probably know things about history that I am not apprised of. And so there needs to be a, a conversation about what came before as we talk about what's happening in our possible futures. And then lastly, we have these tapering points where at some point in a possible future, we are no longer, longer able to imagine what is probable, right? So, Benjamin Franklin once said that uh, nothing is certain in life except for death and taxes, right? So we can sit here in the present and imagine that in future X, we will have death and taxes. But maybe we could get rid of taxes, right? So we can, we can imagine that what we now think is probable, we might not even be able to call probable anymore. This is a, this is a representation of futures 
as subjective perceptions of, of how the world could change. The, the probable kind of tapering off, the impossible is also tapering off. So if right now we think of um, time travel as being an impossibility based on our understanding of physics, as we move forward, there are probably fewer things we can fathom as truly being impossible, right? We've got time travel, you can probably name a few others, some flying carpets or something like that. This is all the impossible stuff. At some point, we just can't imagine any more impossible things than we've already imagined, especially as we move into like, you know, the 500 year future, the 3000 year future. So this is a much more realistic uh, portrayal than this cone that just expands out and out and out and out. Okay, so I will uh, stop boring you with diagrams for the moment. I love diagrams, but I know it's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, Alan mentioned that I run a practice called the Extrapolation Factory, and I wanted to give you a little bit of a um, lay the ground of, of uh, the work that I'm doing through the Extrapolation Factory. Um, if you want to come up with a good name, I suggest multisyllabic words. So a, a project like Hover is okay. Lift, not so great. Extrapolation Factory that people can't even say. It's a great name. Go for it. Use it. Get the, get the URL. Okay, so um, we have a book. I think you guys have it in your library. You can check it out. Um, we've, we've really tried to open source everything that we've done through the practice in our books, um, using social media and uh, publishing the work that we've done on our websites, publishing films, etc. Um, so we invite you to take the work that you're seeing here, that, that you see in the Extrapolation Factory's work, and manipulate it, mess with it, do your own version, uh, hack objects to, to tell stories about futures in ways that make sense to you. Take your own perspective and biases and build those into projects that you think might resonate with folks that you're working with. Um, this is not proprietary in any way. So 99 Cent Futures, and by the way, the Extrapolation Factory is a collaboration between myself and Chris Wobkin, another designer who also studied under Dun & Raby at the Royal College of Art. Um, 99 Cent Futures is the first project that the Extrapolation Factory did. Um, this started back in 2012, and it started really with a student assignment that I gave to a group of students at Parsons, undergrads, um, where I asked them to imagine these specific uh, future objects or products that might tell the story of a future scenario. Um, so we were working out of a studio in downtown Brooklyn, New York, that's surrounded by dollar stores. And dollar stores are really interesting spaces. They um, also are places where we can kind of read some uh, like uh, resolution on what's happening in humanity through the physical artifacts around us, right? You walk through the dollar store and you see these random odds and ends. And at first they just kind of seem like they're all over the map. But I think what's really interesting about the dollar store is when you walk in, you can find things that suit a, a human life from the very beginning, little baby booties that are super cute, all the way through to incontinence diapers for elderly people, right? Like every moment in life is somehow addressed in the dollar store. It's, it's kind of a magical space. There's also something really interesting about the, the aisles of the dollar store. As you walk through this aisle, you're, you're experiencing this slice of time. We've been calling it the time slice. As you walk through the aisle, you're almost time traveling. If you use your imagination, you can, you can imagine what it feels like to be in these different moments, and you can start to imagine what comes next. You can start to imagine what's up here. And so we gave that challenge, imagine what's up here, to a group of like 45 people at our first ever workshop at Columbia University, um, invited them to engage with this four-step process that's building on the ways that futurists work, um, coming from uh, future studies schools like the Manoa School in Hawaii. They start out by taking signals, these uh, instances, or events that are happening in the moments around us uh, that help us to understand how the world might be changing. So these are not patterns, these are not trends, this is not what you see on the front page of Wired that says like the sharing economy is upon us. This is much earlier than that. These are the signals, the first time you see a, you know, a bird scooter or some, one of these like shareable e-scooters and you think, I've never seen anything like that before, what's that about? Right? These like early stage, weak signals 
you see something, maybe nobody else has seen it, or maybe nobody else registers that this is important. You take that and you say, what if the world started to act more like this? And this is the first step that many futurists use as they think about where we might be going. So we invited folks to take a, a batch of signals that we had prepared. We invited them to come up with their own signals. Um, we had about 100 signals prepared. And then we invited them to, to spread them out across this model for digesting data uh, known as STEEP. It stands for Social, Technological, Ecological, Economic, and Political. That's in the book. And then to use these connections of signals to start to play out various stories that one could imagine if the future were to act more like signal XYZ plus ABC. And so we got these very short stories on post-its. And once the stories had emerged, people built these very crude, hacked objects. And so this is what was coming out of the workshop. We, we developed a consistent graphic identity for the, the dollar store objects. Uh, but when you look at this thing, I don't want you to think of a flashlight, a pedicure toe separator, dental tool or whatever, an uh, eyelash curler, I want you to think of a currency converter. This is a new device. You've never seen this before. And this is a really important device in a future scenario where you walk into the bodega and you pay in rupees and you get pesos back. And you need to know, like, are these genuine pesos? Like, did I get the right amount? What's going on? So objects like this are really important only in the fictions in which they live, right? Here's some more. Um, this one's really great. This was based on a, a projection by a futurist who suggests that in the next 10 to 20 years, hallucinogens are going to be re-legalized. Um, and so we might have a scenario where people are playing with new uh, sciences like synthetic biology while they're uh, tripping on legal LSD in a possible future. And so this is a tripocritter ent entertainment kit. You could build your own little life form as a plaything while you're tripping sounds horrifying, but somebody in the workshop came up with this idea. And part of what we're doing is, is reflecting back on this notion that these are discursive objects. We're not necessarily saying we want these futures. We're saying, what if these futures, right? So in the workshop, we got 30 odd discrete ideas that were being proposed. And we mass produced them. We made over 100 objects. And we took them to a dollar store on Flatbush Avenue. We did a little window dressing for them and installed all these objects in the dollar store. And people would walk through and you know, they'd be looking at uh, the Band-Aids or the knockoff Neosporin and they would come across the home transplant kit. And they'd pick it up and they'd flip it over. And in this moment as a consumer where we're used to saying, ah, this shirt, what future scenario can I use this for? Can I wear it to my classes at POD? Could I wear it for an interview? Could I wear it out on a date? Could I wear it to a nice dinner with my parents? Um, you do these kind of very snap judgment futures exercises where you're imagining scenarios. We wanted people to do the exact same things with these propositions. So uh, you know, if you could buy a home transplant kit for 99 cents, it doesn't come with the organ, you have to buy that separately. How do you feel about that future? So people walked through these dollar stores. They were invited to buy these things. And we sold almost every one of the, the pieces. I think there were maybe one or two left over. So we'd say, so why did you buy that? Why, why did you go for that one? Um, the home transplant kit is actually an interesting story. If somebody buys the home transplant kit. She's, she's interested. She's like, I'm not buying this for myself. I'm buying this for my son. My son's a doctor. And I don't know if I like this idea, but I'm going to give it to him. I want him to think about it because I feel like he could make this future a reality. And so this is that really interesting, juicy moment where all of a sudden this concept that was kind of playfully interpreted in a workshop, built into an object, tells the story to a person whom it lands on. They think it's interesting enough to put it in the hands of somebody who could actually bring this into life, into, into reality and maybe this becomes a, a feedback loop that builds a new technology or a new way of doing things. So this started to feel really interesting to us. I'm going to show you one more extrapolation factory project where we kind of tried to take this process a little bit further. Um, this was a project that we did at the Museum of Art and Design up at Columbus Circle. We were invited to produce a piece of work for the, the uh, MAD Triennial. And we're not sure exactly what we were doing, but we kind of liked the idea of installing nothing in the museum. And so we proposed to build a, a pawn shop in the middle of the museum 
and we would set up display cases, and this, the display cases would just be full of junk. And over the course of the three and a half months that the ex exhibition was open, we would work with visitors to the museum to imagine the things you might find in a pawn shop, start to build these objects out to tell stories about versions of futures, and then place those objects nicely inside the display cases. Every time we would uh, meet with visitors, we would talk to them about these processes. And we wanted to get into conversation specifically about value. What is the value of an object? How does the value of an object shift over time? Do we end up with objects that in the future are much more valuable because they're becoming scarce? Or maybe objects are, are a dime a dozen because you can find them everywhere and they've been overproduced, right? What, what informs value in our societies, especially for these used items? So we had a, a workshop space. We kind of used a similar approach the, uh, to the one we used in the 99 Cent Futures Project. And then at the end of each one of these exercises, these new objects would appear in the, the shelves in the museum. And so as people would come through the museum, they would see these different propositions of, of future objects along with a price tag. This is for sale at this amount. We wanted to push this a little bit further. And so here are some of the objects. This is a nice one. This is a, an object for a scenario in which um, climate change makes it actually easier for cockroaches to live. And cockroaches might um, be infesting our homes. We, we kind of can't live in places where they're not living. And so we just all live with cockroaches. And in that world, maybe we need to find better ways to coexist with the cockroaches. Pretend those frogs are cockroaches. Um, so in this scenario, we actually have devices like this one, which is the um, Critter Orchestra. You put the cockroach in this little tray, and then you play a tune, maybe your favorite Lizzo song, and then pull the cockroach out, and it like hums that tune. These are uh, musical cockroaches. So maybe we're happier living with cockroaches that can play our favorite music than cockroaches that just wander around and eat our food. Do we, do we change our relationship to these perceived pests? Um, or drone detection cookie dough. It comes unbaked, you bake it, you eat the cookies, and then you can sense the presence of a drone above your building. That might be important. Um, so we took this idea, we said, all right, what would it be like to, to more intentionally create this feedback loop? We worked with a group of 10 futurists, professional futurists, to write fictional backstories to each one of the objects and then appraise the objects in $2050. And so this one is by um, Yasmin Sherry, who is a, a technologist at um, Microsoft at the time. She's now gone on to be the futurist at Ginkgo Bioworks uh, more recently. But she proposed that you know, the Critter Orchestra might have this, this story behind it, and it winds up being $192 in 2050 dollars. And we put this on a, an online store. So anybody who wanted could go and buy the Critter Orchestra for $192. Sounds a little steep to me, but if you want it, it's yours. Um, so people would buy these things. And with the money from each one of the sales, we would send a framed portrait. We would send the object to the person who bought it. We would send a framed portrait of the object with a little wad of cash, however much it was, usually we didn't sell the expensive ones, to an organization that could potentially impact that future in the direction that this proposition was actually going. And so in the case of the drone detection cookie dough, we sent money to the Alaska Center for Unmanned Aircraft. And this is a, a Department of Defense funded organization that's looking at how we sense um, unmanned aircraft already. They could really kind of work on this more public-facing, civilian-facing technology instead of shifting their gears toward the, the defense side of things. This actually might change the way technologies unfold. So we thought this was a really interesting potential feedback loop. A lot of the work that we do is highly experimental. We never heard back from the Alaska Center for Unmanned Aircraft, so I can't tell you what happened next, but it's possible that they spent this money on like arcade games or something. We'll never know. OK, blue dot. Shifting gears, once again, I want to come back to this notion of uh, how we engage with stories about futures. So I've shown you a bunch of examples of these kind of harebrained future scenarios. They're interesting. They, they certainly could be perceived as discursive, but everybody engages in discourse very differently, right? If we come back to this, this uh, futures narrative cone that I proposed, a lot of the 
images that you saw in that extrapolation factory work are proposed in this moment in the present where they feel impossible. And we're suggesting that maybe one day in the future, they are possible, right? There's this horizontal line as possibility expands. So here's the, the Critter Orchestra. Can't do that now. Maybe we could in 2050. Sounds interesting, I don't know. You show this to you know, your, your grumpy uncle, and they're like, what are you doing in grad school? You're wasting your time. <laughs> what? This is not useful. You just made some trash into other trash. I don't get it. Here's from 99 Cent Futures. This is the instant degree. You pop this in your ear before you go to bed, and when you wake up, you have a BS in astrophysics. Again, you can't do it, right? It's kind of like um, following this line from impossible now to maybe possible in the future. How do we engage with this in a discussion? I think for some people who have more vivid imaginations or who are more naturally playful, these types of ideas are really provocative. And they have a lot of agency. And I'm not dismissing these. But I think for some people, this is a very hard sell. This is very tricky in the context of design. This is a project by Jamin Pack. Um, this is a, a proposition that we're all going to live to 150, 200, 250 years old, and we're going to need to start to change our relationships. So this is the young son, and this is the father. Um, the young son is like having a second childhood. We can't live to 250 years old now. This is, again, kind of like an impossibility now that might become possible in the future. This is Ai Hasegawa, a beautiful project where she proposed that we might want to give birth to a shark instead of a human baby as a way to both deal with our maternal instincts, but also respond to the issues that climate change is kind of placing upon us, right? The stresses. Do we want to bring a new baby human into this world? Maybe not. Let's give birth to a shark. This is Ai Hasegawa's proposition. Can we do this? No. Maybe in the future? Yes. Is it discursive? Absolutely. Does it make your uncle say, what the hell are you doing in grad school? <laughs> Probably, right? I'm sorry to your uncle. Um, Dunn and Raby proposing a future scenario in which we have um, alternative mobility uh, approaches. We have all sorts of like uh, human-powered mobility options. And so people start to engineer themselves to optimize for these like um, group bicycles to get around town. Uh, maybe it's like a 40-person tandem bike. And so everybody looks like this. Um, are we doing that? Can we do that right now? Not really. We're not engineering our bodies to this capacity. This is a project that I did as a first year graduate student proposing that we might be able to synthetically modify mosquitoes to produce a, some kind of serotonin based liquid that goes into your, your bloodstream and makes you happier in a future where we have more natural disasters. We are having more natural disasters. We can't genetically modify the mosquitoes. It's not possible now, maybe in the future. It's a little bit sad. Sorry, Alan. OK, so we've got these examples of projects where we, we see some proposition of impossibility in the present that transitioned into a, a proposed possibility in a future scenario. It might work for some people. It might not work for other people. This is maybe an opportunity to step back and say, is there another way? Is there another way that we can engage with discursive design that includes these people who are not necessarily on board to do this radical thinking? Let's say, for example, you go to a client after you graduate. Uh, maybe this is a, a client in city government. And they are not game to do some like really wackadoo stuff with their design consultant. How do you help them get into the space of speculative design or discursive design in a way that's comfortable to them, but also productively kind of provocative. So what if we were to start with things that sit in this possible space and slowly transition into the plausible, that slowly transition into the probable? This is the, the proposition that I think is actually very powerful. It looks super simple, but it's very powerful in the context of the city government official who's not sure how to you know, uh, make heads or tails of, of what you're bringing to them. Or maybe the, the stodgy uh, financial client who is not sure they need speculative design, but is maybe a little bit interested, right? So this is a, a proposition that was created in the Pond Tomorrow project. This is just a device that allows us to pay off the national debt as individuals whenever we have spare change. We feed the spare change into the machine, and that spare change goes into the national debt. We could do that today. 
There's no technology there that, has, uh, that doesn't exist right now. We could you know, easily build an app for that today, and it could happen. The only reason we're not doing this is because we have a social rule, and I'm speaking in, in the terms of the US government right now, but uh, probably in most countries, we don't believe that it's right for us to give any more money to our government than we absolutely have to, right? But what if we change the social rules or bent the social rules that we live within to say, yeah, I've got some spare change. I'm just gonna like drop that in the coffers of the, the federal government. We can all work together to make this thing happen. Could we bend that social rule and introduce a new way of living? So these are the next few projects I'm gonna show, and this will wrap up the talk, are experiments in social rule bending, proposing ways that we could bend the rules of now to propose an alternative way of living that don't introduce any new crazy technologies that are not accomplishable at the moment with the, the physics that, that we live within, uh, the world that we understand. These are just social rule bending exercises. So I'm gonna start off with me as a much younger self. This is in grad school. I proposed a series of alternative business models for the low carbon energy economy. And each one of these suggest that we might be able to get people on board with low carbon energy technologies if we could just tweak the business model. If we could say, let's borrow something that Google is doing. Let's borrow something that the, the lottery is doing. Let's borrow something that Verizon is doing. And we can actually make solar energy cost competitive for everybody and bring it on board. Instead of trying to tweak the, the technology, make it um, you know, more uh, uh, efficient, whatever needs to happen, Maybe the efficiency is, is enough, and all we need to do is change the business model. So this earlier one that I showed, the thrill attraction model, proposes that we might be able to use the system that's currently used in the lottery to entice people to, to pay for solar energy that's maybe a little bit more expensive uh, by offering them a lottery ticket at the bottom of their energy bill. So every time you get your energy bill, you're super excited, comes in the mail, you tear it open, you read the number to check to see if you're a winner. Right? And so in order to test this idea, I wanted to find ways to uh, build these discursive moments. So I actually built a, a solar energy lottery ball tumbler. So this is a, a solar uh, dish. It collects energy in a little, um, with the dish in a little like steam chamber. And then a tube runs over here and turns a tiny motor and it tumbles lottery balls. And so people would come up to me, this is in Hyde Park in London, people would come up to me and kind of ask me what was going on, and I would introduce the business model, dressed as a business person, um, and suggest that they might be one of the, the first customers of this new solar energy lottery business. And this took us into these really interesting discursive spaces, where we could absolutely do this today. There are no bars, technological bars, keeping us from doing this right now. This is purely a, a social rule that I was proposing we bend. Currently, we think of the, the manipulative strategies of the lottery as being a little bit problematic. Does it prey upon certain people who don't have a, a deeper sense of statistics? Um, who, who does this money go to? Who is this money coming from? Um, do we think that solar energy companies, or green energy companies in general, should be more altruistic than fossil fuel energy companies? Most people do. But if we could start to bend some of those social rules and say, all right, maybe if we really want solar energy, we need to ease off a little bit on this like forceful, altruistic hammer that we hold over the solar energy companies and allow them to play the same game as some of these other organizations. So this discourse ended up in the um, Imperial College uh, Symposium on Energy Research. And it, it was the, the final presentation after 12 PhDs proposing different uh, blade designs for wind turbines. And this launched, and everybody in the crowd was talking. They were saying, oh, I've got an idea. I know how we could change the business model. I know how we could change the business model. They invited me out to dinner with them afterwards. <laughs> and I felt like that was like the check mark of success for my thesis project, saying, yeah, we actually can start to imagine different rules, social rules, if we're given the opportunity to do so. Um, this is a project I really love by Adam Harvey. He was a graduate from ITP. Um, he was proposing that we could do things as simple as changing our hairstyles and makeup as a way to fool the, the image capture and image tracking devices that are ubiquitous around us in cities. 
there's nothing about this design that we can't do right now. And in fact, there have been many emulators who have proposed uh, other ways to kind of fool the camera. But this is super simple. Just paint on a little bit of makeup, get that really gorgeous haircut, and <laughs> the computer cannot see you. It's, it's amazing. Right here, a few more that he came up with. I'm a big fan of that one. I was thinking of doing that myself. This is a social rule. We currently don't think that, like, I mean, you guys are all sitting here. I don't see any blue hair. We don't think that this is, for the most part, a, a very desirable way to look. But if we were to change these social rules that we all have about what's OK, what's acceptable as we sit in a, a lecture hall, um, maybe we all would start to wear these things, these, these hairstyles and, and makeup patterns. and we would really be pushing back against a technology that's, that's growing very quickly. All right, here's another one. I think I have actually miscredited. This is uh, Lina Ko uh, Kosacevic. Um, this one is also her. I'll show you Yosuke's piece in a second. This is a proposition for a romantic online dinner. Um, so Lina proposed that in a world in which long distance, global long distance relationships are more and more common we need to start taking them seriously, and we need to think about how romance is built into these moments. So this is the plate that you might use for the romantic dinner. This is the, the tablecloth that you would lay over your keyboard, so you could still type to your lover and have this kind of like gold embroidery. It's very elegant, but you also don't get whatever tomato sauce spilled into your laptop. The, the pearl necklace in your, your earbuds, this dates the project, because we all now no longer have cords, but that's beside the point. But you can imagine the, the level of romantic interest that these types of artifacts would bring to this long distance relationship. It totally transforms it, or does it? You know, this is the discursive moment that we get into. How does this change our relationship to other people, to technologies? Do we really want to have a, a romantic dinner sitting at our computer? Maybe some of us do it, because we are in long distance relationships, and the technology has allowed us to do this. How, how do we negotiate this very difficult moment? There's not an easy right answer, right? We, we want to be with that person, and at the same time, we want to be in different places. This is the moment we live in. This necessitates discourse, just like the mosquito, the Gates mosquito, it necessitates discourse. And these objects could all be built today. There's nothing here that uses technologies that are, that are more advanced than we've been working with for ages. Uh, this is a project by Heather Dewey Hagborg. She's based in New York. She did a really beautiful project where she walked around New York City collecting a piece of chewed gum, cigarette butts, pieces of hair, and she ran DNA sequencing on every one of these objects to try to figure out who this might have come from. Based on the DNA sequencing that's currently used in forensic studies, in court cases, to try to identify uh, culprits, um, she actually created 3D images supposedly show who this person is or what this person looks like. She only used technology that we could use today. I see you shaking your head. There's something really wrong here, right? <laughs> this is a beautiful discursive moment using only technologies that exist around us right now. We could do this if we wanted to. We could all be doing this. We could all go out and collect the cigarette butts. There could be a, a New York City office of uh, DNA collection. This could be a now, but it's not and it shapes a beautiful discourse. This is uh, Yosuke Yoshigomi. Um, I mislabeled one of the slides earlier, but so Yo Yosuke uh, was very interested in, again, kind of taking this approach, what I'm calling social rule bending. I don't know if he's actually used that phrase, but I, I think he would be happy with this. Um, and he suggested that there are a number of uh, countries that are, are bordering one another or are uh, very close that are at war and or, or have some kind of conflict. And there might be different ways to resolve the conflict. And so I believe this is meant to be the border between India and Pakistan. And this is a, a performance that he imagines might help us to resolve these very tense moments. So if things get too out of hand, these two trucks with these performative dancers pull up to the border. I believe there would be a fence there. They pull right up. These two people do their craziest walks that they can possibly do. They approach the border. Everybody's watching and then they shake hands, and somehow some of the tension might be slightly dissolved. Could this actually happen? Socially? I'm not sure. Technologically? Absolutely. We could do this. So as a way to, to bring this into the world, he actually built, I love these things, he built these um, 
model kits. So in, in theory, you could build your own little uh, Hatha Milana um, truck set. And um, here it is. It's got like a little animatronic. The figures walk closer to each other. Here you can see the fence between the two countries. Um, and then there's like a handshaking action. Um, and to take it one step further, he actually built the kits and then he did his own YouTube unboxing video. And so you can go on YouTube and watch uh, Yosuke unbox his own thesis project as if he had just bought it from the model shop. It's, it's gorgeous, you should go watch it. Um, the last one that I wanna share is by three graduates from the Parsons Transdisciplinary Design Program, Andrea, Ricardo, and Stephanie. Um, we asked them to imagine how mobility and transit might change in future scenarios. And we said, don't look at uh, driverless cars, automated vehicles, etc. Look at other ways to manage these issues. And they proposed something really interesting, something really radical. They said, normally when you look at the, the gridlock in cities, it's all because we have these two moments where everybody's trying to get somewhere at the same time, right? We have rush hour in the morning, rush hour in the evening. What if we could somehow stretch all of that commuting across multiple times? And so they proposed that New York City might have three different time zones. Time zone A, B, C, or one, two, three, um, where some people were waking up super early to get to work, and some people's work, work day didn't end until much later in the evening. Obviously, most people would want to be in this time zone two, the orange one, and so if you're in the orange one, you kind of live your life as normal. But if you live in time zone one or time zone three, the office of Department of Time, as they called it, would give you all sorts of special perks. So if you were in time zone three, you could hop in any of these designated cabs. They were, they were yours for the taking. Time zone two, sorry, you, you can't hail that cab. If you're driving your car into the city, there are kind of different lights that tell you where you can and can't park. So here, time zone three, can't park there. So again, this is very simple, social rule bending at its finest. These students are suggesting that we could play with the the social rules that we all live in, where we think we have to get to places at the same time as an eight, nine million uh, person society in one city, there's no reason we have to do that, right? We could change that. We could find other ways. This is not proposing any new technology. Maybe the sign would take a little bit of R&D, but otherwise, this is technology that we have today. It's purely a, a proposition in social rule bending. Here we have uh, another romantic dinner. Apparently romantic dinners are big in the speculative design community. This is a romantic dinner. Actually, I think this is a, a breakfast from a time zone three-er and a dinner from a time zone one-er. You know, they're kind of like mismatched, but they can still hang out. Um, and then this is a family that is living on three different time zones. So mom is a time zone one and the kid is a time zone three. Uh, might challenge some of the helicopter parents out there who really want to kind of watch every move of the kid, but um, I think the, the son seems to be tucking himself into bed just fine at midnight. Anyway, so I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, I'm happy to stick around and talk to you guys more about this idea. Hopefully it's useful to you, um, but thank you very much for having me. This has been great. Well, first of all, thank you so much for coming. That was a great um, presentation. And yeah, I think a lot of our second years, our assignment this week for our thesis is to create a speculative 3D object. So I think this was a really helpful talk for us to kind of really understand where those limits are and pushing them. Um, I was actually interested in hearing about that point of view um, for a scare tactic for a more dystopian future. Um, I'm looking at pregnancy and maternity and how that affects women of color and the current healthcare system. So I'm trying to maybe push that um, scope into kind of a world where it's safer to give birth literally anywhere else other than a hospital um, and kind of trying to design for that. So yeah, I guess what's, what are your perspectives on design that is discurse, discourse, discursive and experimental, but kind of in a world we don't want to live in? Sure, um, you can keep the mic, you can pass it around. Um, so generally in the, the workshops that I run and in the teaching that I do at the New School, um, I, I try to be very conscious of the utility of, of dystopia. 
I think dystopia has its places. Um, oftentimes we can use the word cautionary. It might be a little bit more nuanced than dystopia. Um, dystopia also comes with a lot of, of problematic connotations. Dystopias are frequently used in entertainment, in Hollywood, in the movies. Um, people tune out when we see dystopias um, in terms of uh, truly engaging in discourse, right? If you show someone a dystopic uh, scene, well, they'll say, yeah, of course I don't want that, right? And if our objective is to get into a discursive space, we may undermine ourselves by just going straight for the dystopia. And so oftentimes when I'm working with students, uh, what I challenge them to do is to find that cautionary space that integrates some benefit, new added benefit, that balances with some of the dystopic or, or cautionary features so that it feels like a conflicting, challenging world that we actually know, right? The world today is not easy to figure out oftentimes. And if we can propose projects that mirror some of that difficulty, but at the same time um, kind of frame a, a new issue, um, then, then we might actually be getting into a useful discursive space. I think there's sometimes a desire to be um, a bit, um, I don't know, to, for the, the project to tell us what to think, to tell us what to, to do, and to say, well, of course you don't want this. And in those cases, it might be better as like an awareness campaign than as a, a speculative project. In those cases, I don't think it's, it's necessary to get into the discourse as much as just to say, so how do we make it better? Whereas in other situations where we truly don't know what we want, we can think about it and think about it, we're not sure where to go. I think those are the moments where we need the discourse. The discourse has much more agency there. So um, you might, you know, of course we're all passionate about certain things. Um, not every project assignment is a perfect fit for every design approach. And so if the assignment is to do something in this speculative oeuvre, maybe that project context is one that fits better in another uh, brief down the road. Or maybe there's another angle where there's a, a really challenging component to it um, that you yourself don't know the answer to, right? It's not like I want it to be safer to give birth um, for people of color in hospitals. Like that's a clear path forward. We can all agree on that. Uh, but is there a part of this situation that you yourself don't have the answer to that you'd like to use discursive design to unravel? Yeah. Thank you. Um, hi, thank you for sharing all this really interesting work. I'm especially interested in a lot of the co-creation projects that you worked on, um, thinking about like what are some of the tactics you used, I think, in terms of balancing um, the participatory aspect, like really instigating people's imaginations but without priming them to like think a certain way or framing it in a particular way. That's a great question and it's a really difficult one for us in our practice at the Extrapolation Factory. Um, I think from the very first day as we started running these projects, we acknowledged that we were never going to run a project that didn't introduce our own biases. Our biases and perspectives would always be there. And we had to own that. We had to make that very um, visible as, as we introduced the projects, invited other biases into the projects, um, invited participants to challenge us to say, actually, I think this signals database looks very white male. And my collaborator is also a white male. So, um, you know, like making room for those types of opportunities to push back and say, um, it's great that, that you've uh, introduced synthetic biology in this database, but what about, you know, um, you know challenges having to do with um, giving birth in hosp hospitals in New York City? Like, how do we, um, introduce the, the perspectives um, in real time, even if they're not there to begin with. So we do a lot of work to draw from uh, signals uh, from people who have biases and perspectives that are not our own. Um, I think in part that comes of following people on Twitter who come from different social demographics, different um, race or ethnic demographics, different parts of the world, uh, people who are researching different contexts. Um, and, and we draw signals from what they're talking about. But that's, you know, it only goes so far. 
So there will always be bias in the work that you do. I think the, um, the challenge um, or the, the problem comes when you realize that you're biased and therefore you freeze and don't do anything. I think it's better to you know, kind of put something out there and say, what about this? And have people push back on it than to say, well, I'm biased, so I guess I'll just not do anything at all. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's always going to be there. What do you think about uh, the future of, uh, of algorithmic decision making? Um, OK, so a couple notes. One, I don't consider myself a futurist. Um, and I, I think that's important just because uh, it's really easy to kind of you know, add titles or like put on hats and be like, I'm a futurist. And there is actually a, a field of future studies. You can get a PhD in future studies. Those people are futurists. It, it is starting to be very cool to be like, yeah, and I'm a futurist. I'll just put that on my LinkedIn page. Um, but I, I think there are people who are futurists, and there are people who do a good job of thinking about futures. Um, and I think of myself as a designer who's very passionate about futures research, futures methodologies, thinking about how we democratize uh, conceptualizing futures narratives. Uh, but I don't necessarily have uh, a lot of foresight that other people don't have. So I'm much more interested in the methodology. My, my database of futures projections is not the same as someone who's been doing this for 20 odd years. Um, so I'll just put that out there. Uh, the question was data analysis, data analytics? Uh, algorithmic decision making. Algorithmic decision making. Um, I think algorithmic decision making is uh, in its very early stages. It, it, there are some moments in which we see algorithm, algorithmic decision making um, applied in, in productive ways. I think there are a lot of scenarios where it's very harmful and it actually reflects the bias that we were just talking about of the people who have written the algorithms um, sometimes and more often the people who have decided on where the, the data set is coming from. And so there may be kind of a, um, like a, a super algorithm, which some people would argue is evolution. You know, evolution is the ultimate algorithm. I don't think we understand that algorithm if it is even the ultimate algorithm. And uh, at this point, we're writing algorithms that are, are truly based on a lot of biases that, that we hold. And so if we start to use algorithmic decision making for uh, issues such as um, whether someone should be offered parole or not, which is actually happening in certain contexts, or other, I don't know if it's parole, but legal decisions in the court, um, I think we need to be very, very careful about what information is being baked into that algorithm and in the data set that we're not already thinking about. Okay, hi, uh, thank you so much for coming. My name is Sona, and I'm really interested in the intersection of speculative design and social design. How do you um, kind of place anchor that um, speculative design into, like, for example, reducing social tensions or um, kind of unstigmatizing um, in this current climate? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that, that question is, is one that's on the tip of a lot of people's tongues right now. Many people are thinking about it. Um, it in some ways comes back to, tell me your name again? Oh, Victoria. Victoria's uh, comment. Um, it might be that you know, we, what we want to do is reduce the social tension. And maybe there's a way that a speculative proposition or a discursive proposition reduces the social tension. But if the nature of discursive design is to, to frame a discourse, it might not be the best uh, approach to reducing the social tension, it might actually be better at shaping a discourse about how to reduce the social tension, right? So I think it has a lot to do with um, the way we perceive these approaches as, let's call them tools, right? And so if you have a, a screw and uh, someone gives you a speculative design hammer, you can like hammer all day on the screw and it's, it's not going to do the job because the hammer is meant to drive nails. And if you have a, um, let's say for example, again, like an a awareness campaign, that might be a better tool for challenging this issue around the, um, the harms of birth in uh, hospitals. So 
I don't think that speculative design is good for everything, and I don't think that we should ask it to be good at everything. I think there are certain things that speculative design really does well, and this is why I gave that example of the Gates mosquito in the first place. Um, that is a moment in, in my mind where I think we really need a social conversation around what to do in a moment where we don't know what to do. And it sounds like what you're talking about is a situation in which we know what we want. We know the, the outcome. Um, we might need to do a little bit of innovative thinking to figure out how best to get to that outcome, but we don't know what the, um, uh, we already know where we want to go. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, cool, thanks. Hi, my name is Catherine. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is a great talk. Um, you mentioned that a lot of the people that you think are successful at creating discursive or speculative objects are often very playful. Uh, what elements of the objects themselves do you think help perhaps the recipients of those to become playful themselves, if that makes sense? Um, that's a great question. One of my favorite references um, comes from a, an evolutionary theorist named Barbara Fredrickson. Um, and Fredrickson proposes that as um, early stage humans on Earth, um, we evolved to have different emotions, and those emotions allowed us to do different things. Fredrickson says that in situations where we're experiencing negative emotion, oftentimes we have an immediate threat. You eat a, a poison berry, it makes you feel disgust. There's a bear coming after you, you feel fear. The neighboring tribe is trying to like steal some of your land, you feel anger. Uh, so on and so forth. There are all these negative emotions. Um, there might be the moment where you eat the peyote and you feel a super positive emotion and you're just kind of like in that dream state. That's cool. But Fredrickson suggests that there are moments where we feel kind of like generally positive, kind of like plateau-y emotions. These, these mostly positive but not like giddy emotions. And those are the mo uh, moments where we can start to think about long-term futures. And she said that evolutionarily, they're actually really important to allowing us to make plans and adapt and move forward beyond the state that we're in currently. We're not running from the bear. We're not fighting off the neighboring tribe. We're thinking about the long term. And so those positive emotions are actually critical. And that's why I think a lot of these successful projects bring in a little bit of this positivity or this kind of like, um, uh, comfort. They're, they're not hyper dystopian. Um, if we get into a dystopian narrative, uh, either we throw it out or we uh, indulge it and we allow ourselves to be kind of attacked from the, uh, by the bear in the movie theater with the popcorn, right? It's like this weird mix of like fear and safety. Um, so, so that's where this, this um, affinity for kind of playfulness, fun, um, not like um, mad hysteria, but, but positive emotions, I think, actually comes from in speculative design and probably most other design projects. Um, so how best to do it? I think that is a very difficult question, um, and I don't think there's any one right answer. Uh, we all know that like sense of humor is a very uh, it's personal, right? Everybody's sense of humor is a little bit different. And one person might crack a joke and you're just like, what are you talking about? But it's funny to another person. So I, I think finding that kind of like sensitivity to, to humor that lands with the audience you're designing for is exactly like designing anything else, right? You, like, you understand who it is you're talking to and, and how they work and, and what makes them smile or um, what would be... Um, uplifting to them or, or what would feel playful to them. Um, in the context of the dollar store, I think there's something that most people find humorous about the, the kind of um, outright ridiculousness of the knockoffs that you find, right? You go in and you find something just, that just like, it's the hammer, but it's like a plastic hammer that would fall apart when you first hit the nail. And there's something funny about that. It's like, is this real? Like, are they actually selling this thing? Like, this is never going to work. And, and so it kind of toys with our, our notions of, like, perception and, and reality. Um, but, it, yeah, there's not a silver bullet for, for humor. 
um, I, or, or fun. I think you have to kind of work it, massage it, and find your own. I think everybody has a different approach to shaping these moments that, that bring positive affect into a situation where we're then going to be very discursive. Hi. Hi, my name is Dana. Uh, I have a question. Like many, most people box designers as object makers, artifact designers, and nothing else. So when you introduce the speculative, de speculative design and discursive design, how, how and when can we as designers start transmitting that to other people? So people, like designers are the ones that are gonna shape the future. Like we are the ones that are gonna put the rules, right. like go this way or go that one and society is gonna follow. Right. So how can we like separate, uh, separate ourselves from the object design and start shifting towards that and actually get like society's, not credibility, but like saying like, oh, okay, something is happening, I need to listen and something's changing. So you're just asking for my elevator pitch now. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Um, again, I, I think it's like, uh, it really comes down to who you're talking to. Everybody hears these ideas in very different ways. And so you have to kind of, just like a DJ reads the crowd, you have to like read the audience. You have to read the person that you're speaking to and get where they're coming from. Um, I think the other thing that you can do that just goes like miles farther than anybody gives it credit for is to practice. Um, and I'm sure you've heard that a million times, but like, you know, give your elevator pitch at a bar, give your elevator pitch at a um, whatever, the Izu Festival, wherever you are, like tell people what you're doing and like try it slightly differently every time you do it and see how it lands, see how they understand it. Um, I think probably some of the most useful opportunities I've had to fine tune my elevator pitch are in moments where I'm like stuck at a, um, an exhibition standing next to my work for eight hours a day for like four days straight and just like telling people time after time after time what it is that I'm trying to get done here. Um, so one of my many elevator pitch variants goes something like, what if, um, what if you think back to your experience as a, a grade school kid, right? You probably had um, classes in math, you probably had classes in science, classes in history. Did you have any classes in futures? No, but we all have a very close relationship to futures. And it feels kind of impossible to teach about futures, but, and this is something that most people don't know, there are actually PhD programs where you can go and study how to think about long-term futures. Isn't it kind of crazy that we don't do that in more parts of society? That's what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to introduce future studies approaches and languages into spaces that don't currently use them as a way to shape a, a broader public that feels like they can impact the future. So that's my elevator pitch. I was just t talking to you in an elevator. We're, we're back in the room now. Um, so yeah, but like, you know, that type of elevator pitch took me years to, to figure out. Like, how do I introduce this notion of future studies in a way that's relatable to the person I'm talking to where are they coming from? I meet them on the street. Like one thing that most people have in common is a primary school education. Cool, let's start from there. And here's this thing that like you didn't even know you were missing. Let me tell you about how it was not there and how there's actually like a whole world that could be plugged in there and design might be the conduit to make that possible. Um, when, we t uh, when we talk about the future design, um, I'm saying uh, will it <laughs> if we choose, <laughs> Like uh, if we choose uh, one particular possible solution of the whole possibility, and I think at the same time we choose to give up and abandon the whole the other possibilities. And as an example, like uh, uh, like uh, Amazon, they are they have a, a blueprint about the the drone delivery. They have a, a aircraft carrier full of the, the package and the drone, and so that we don't need more the postman or some driver to deliver it to the different buildings so that they could deliver a whole package you know, faster, which sounds great, but how about the postman? How about the, the carrier company? And how's going with them? So 
if we, my question is about if we choose someone we design for, for so that they could live better, but at the same time we might do some harm on the others. So how should we make that decision to, to I don't know. Sounds like you just explained discursive design perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> we can we can swap spots now. I, I think you know just very I'm playfully responding, but uh, very simply, um, discursive design is never about solutions. We don't use the word solutions when we're we're talking about discursive design. We're not solving the problem. We're probably complicating the problem. We're making it harder to understand. Not harder to understand, but like we're introducing new facets of the problem that we haven't even thought about before. I always use the example of the um, uh, early stage futurist in, in the beginning of last century who was able to foresee the automobile before everybody else, right? That, that's a good futurist. But an even better futurist is the one who can foresee the problem, who can see all the traffic jams that will come about because of the automobile. And so what that futurist is doing is not inventing the solution, but inventing problems. So oftentimes what we're doing as we're imagining future scenarios is coming up with problems that we've never seen before because we think they might be important to think about. And that's where the discourse starts to exist. Right? We, we throw out a bunch of problems and say, what would we do if this were to happen or this were to happen? Um, and so if you, if you move away from the language of solutions, we know we're not going to solve climate change with a product or a poster or like any of these other traditional design outcomes. But if we instead situate ourselves as practitioners who can respond to climate change or can shape a, a small discourse around one facet of climate change, that's probably a more honest and humble approach as a designer than going out and saying, oh, I'm going to solve this thing. Because we know we're not going to do that single-handedly um, and on this uh, short time span. Um, so yeah, I think if, if you can set up the work that you do in a way that allows you to produce very um, believable, um, provocative problems in spaces that currently don't exist, then you're actually doing a really good job as a speculative designer. Cool. All right. So let's leave it there. Um, I'll hang around for a little bit if you guys want to keep chatting. Uh, you can also find me on the web. You can email me at um, elliot at newschool.edu or on social at epmid. Uh, but thank you again. This has been a lot of fun. And good luck to all of you. <laughs>